Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Indigenous Wisdom for the Earth series. We have some very special guests this month and I'm very excited to introduce them. So let's go ahead and get started. First, I would like to introduce Palm. He is from the Winnemean Wintu tribe and he is the co-director of the film, One Word, Sawamin. And next to him is Natasha. She also is a co-director of the film. And we're very, very fortunate to have them here with us to talk about the film. And in addition, I have a special guest host. His name is Mark Dubois. So, Tom, would you like to give us a little description about the film and give us a brief introduction? Yes, hello. My name is Michael Preston. Uh, my native name is Palm Pahato, or Palm for short, uh, from the Winnemem Wintu tribe. And we made a film about our perspective on sacred water. And the word for that is called Sawamen. And we do our best to represent that in our walk, in our speech, in our just manner of living, and what we represent in our long term vision. For our river, the McLeod River, where we come from, that's what Winnemem means. And that you know, trickles down to the Bay Area where our water drains into. And that's the area of the world that we're speaking from and, and the context where which this film takes place. Wonderful. This is a very powerful film and we're gonna give you a little teaser in just a moment. And we're also gonna supply a link that they've set up for Tree Sisters to come and watch the film as well. Um, we'll set that up on our webpage. Everybody will be able to access it. But Natasha, would you like to show us a short preview of what the film is about? Sure. I was one of four California native people. And I was probably like one of 20 Native American people at UC Berkeley. I was definitely the only Winneman went to, that's for sure. There's like 35,000 people at that university. And so in many of my classes, there was nobody representing that worldview. Spirit doesn't exist in the academic realms for the most part. Nobody talks about spirit, like it's taboo even, to talk about spirit in school. So you have to learn how to validate spirituality without saying spirituality. I was the only one talking about the sacred. I was talking about my homelands in Mount Shasta. I was trying to remind people through academic language of how one relates to ecosystems and how to protect them and why traditional ecological knowledge and the native worldview is important. It was isolating, fun, beautiful, hard, amazing. Sawa Mem means sacred water. How much vast insight one can get from water and how much just beauty exists in it, really. And how much hope. It's a spiritual entity with divine intelligence is what it is.
Tahato is my native name. I come from the Winnem and Wintu tribe. We were born out of Mount Shasta and we populate the McLeod River. We're born from Sawa Mem. It's the spiritual essence of where we come from. 80% of the world, and we should be a part of that in its truest form. Thank you. Yeah, that was an amazing preview into the rest of the film. And, uh, you know, I want to open the floor to what you feel most called to share first. I mean, I have some questions that I'd love to discuss, but I want to hear what's most important for you to share. I'm open to the questions. Um, nothing's coming to mind at this exact moment. Um, maybe I could be guided a little bit from the questions, but I think I could wrap it up at the end with things that are updating things on a little bit on what we're what we're doing. All right, that sounds amazing. I think when I was watching that, it just really hit home when you were saying spirit doesn't exist in the academic realms. There is a lack of sacred and a lack of people understanding how to relate to the land and the world around them. Um, and you know, it, it never really occurred to me because I've never lived from that place of being in a relationship with the land to the degree I'm sure that you have. And uh, we probably should also mention this is in California. So it's a tribe that lives in California. Um, can you speak a little bit, bit to what that's like to go into an establishment where there is no sacred existing and how, how, do, you, how do you cope with that? What is, what's the experience like? Uh, well, we, we've had training from our you know, very beginning days, first going into schools and kindergarten for me and well, preschool and feeling that spirit didn't exist in there. And, and knowing that when I was four years old and never changing all the way up into university system was no different for me. But I was a little bit surprised, I guess, because I feel like it should be a part of environmental studies uh, because in our view that that's that's the highest form of environmental studies is the relationship with it on a spiritual level and if it's not in there then it's missing a big part of the truth and so i wasn't really impressed with it very much for that reason and i was kind of uh, for that reason it kind of made it a little bit dry but i it, it does exist in there I, I found out through my years through a term called traditional ecological knowledge, which I learned at a conference I went to for ACES, American Indians and in Science and Engineering Society. I first heard the term TEK and that allowed for spirit to exist in the um, you know, restoration of our homelands and sacred site and giving voice to nature. Um, so it wasn't really surprising for me, but it's definitely worth noting and and, and should be talked about and should be more covered in academic curriculums. Yes, oh, absolutely, I agree. Um, Mark, did you have any questions around that piece that you wanted to ask? Or? Well, I'll just more offer a, a comment. You know, I, I mentioned that a river sort of tutored me. You know, I grew up in Sacramento in the middle of California's great Central Valley and discovered caves and down below the caves was a river and that river and the slow getting connected with that place taught me things that I've never heard any English language to have. And so 
while it drew me onto, uh, you know, into a life of learning about politics and how do you change water politics? I've, I've never, for me, I've never had any language that conveyed why I do what I do. I mean, people could, could hear there was something deeper there, but, but yeah, and to me, there's nothing in English that can, you know, it is, it's been powerful to experience in the last 10 years, the word sacred coming into use where before it was sort of controlled by, you know, lovely religions and, and, and yet we inherited being amputated from the earth and from all of our neighbors. So your, the beauty of you conveying your experience, having been with a community that never lost touch with those sacred roots to the land and the water. And yeah, the, the, the two of you gifting a film that give people access to another whole way of perceiving that, that most of us aren't exposed to. So it's just such powerful, beautiful work the two of you are doing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. One experience that we have had in sharing the film with the scientific community is that it's almost like the film gives them permission to speak of the sacred and spirit where otherwise they don't receive it. Like somehow the fact that Pom was talking about it and sharing is like, oh, finally, I get, I get to have this conversation of something, you know, because if you're a scientist, an environmental scientist, like your connection to the work is a love connection, right? Um, yeah. And because if only because you have spent so much time um, deeply listening to the earth. Mm. So, so that love, you know, eventually you run out of words for that and it becomes something sacred. So, so it's something they were familiar with, but just didn't have permission to discuss, um, which, you know, like Pom says, is so limiting um, when it comes to actually doing environmental work. So that was a very hopeful um, experience that I found that we had. Mm. Beautiful. Um, Paul, one question for you would be, you know, when some of the, you know, the tribes of California that I had exposure to, I just felt like their, their, their soul had been sucked out of them by this, you know, my ancestors, in fact, were gold miners, right? And so before I knew that, I was in love with the river in the middle of the mother load, so in the middle of gold country. And I started hearing about all the horrific stories of how the settlers came and, you know, and the annihilation they did of the indigenous peoples. And um, the peoples that I met, I could feel that they're, they're because this modern quote unquote paradigm came in, they didn't have any language either and they were discarded. What's your sense of how your community maintained that sacred reverence in the midst of a dominator culture that didn't allow sacred to be seen through the trees um, or in the rivers and the water? Um, any insights on how your community managed not to be uh... <sighs> right? There's a couple of theories on it. Uh, truth, though, for me, is the survival of what they call the doctoring way. Florence Jones was our leader before my mother, who is my great great grandmother. I mean, great great auntie. She's everybody's grandmother. But she brought forth the, the Winamim belief system into the the now into 2003 when she passed away she was our last fluent speaker and she managed to reach their highest form of uh healer ways you might call it she she was the, she reached the top of it and 
just happened to be during this time. She was born in 1907 and 2003 is when she passed away and she reached the height of the, our lineage, the lack of a better word, religious ways. Like she reached the, the top level of, of, of human potential mm-hmm. um, in our way, in our, in, as far as healing is concerned and how one goes into trance and goes into spiritual readings for people, for the land and interpretations of, of places and in communion with sacred sites. And so I got to witness that and was born a believer in that sense because she performed miracles that defied reality. Mm-hmm. And I went into school knowing that there was more to this world than what they taught us. And always knowing that to this day, knowing that there's more to this world than what they're teaching us right now. And so that's how it survived in me. And one of the reasons, the theories about how she was able to maintain that, because they sent her off to boarding school. She basically prayed that that boarding school burnt down because there's a lot of atrocities. This is in Greenville, I believe. And it did burn down and she escaped and went back home and wasn't there for very long. And that's one reason how it survived. And she taught other people and there was a lot more people back then. And there was another reason why we survived it into the now is because we are a federally unrecognized tribe. There's a long story, but that's one theory about how we man- oh, managed hmm. to hmm. maintain the belief system because we didn't have to adopt the democratic form of system of government. You didn't have the, the, the moneyed uh, support that uh, um, <laughs> whatever colonial language, oh, we're, we're taking care of them because of the treaties, the <clears throat> Department, you know, Department of Indian Affairs will take care of you because, yeah, so, wow. That's uh, so lucky and unlucky, being recognized or not being recognized. <laughs> Yeah, our, our area of the country also managed to escape the Spanish colonialism as well. That's true. Further north. Yeah, and we were a canyonist uh, people, and so we were relatively protected in that sense. Right. That's beautiful to hear about. I really appreciate you sharing that. And yeah, that's. I think that's something that really needs to be spoken about more often. I think the lack of awareness that the average person has about the situations is in need of an education, we'll just say. Um, and actually to that end, I, you know, I think most of our network will understand what sacred water means, but for those of those people out there who don't know, what do you mean by sacred water? Can you, either of you give us a little indication on how is water sacred and, and what is that relationship about? Yeah, the, the word Sawa Mem refers to the original creation waters before humans were even here. And speaking to, to that water before, when, when the world was more water-like and, and Sawa Mem is referring to the ancient waters that were here. Um, and it refers to water having spirit, kind of everything that we're, they're confirming now, even though they, they try to dis credit it but water basically having emotion and reacting to human emotion reacting to song reacting to prayer reacting to dance everything that is life water reacts to and it and it's has intelligence to it and sawa mem is referring to all of this encompassing Mm. um, the spiritual entity and the great mystery that water is as well inside of it and and it tries to describe the spiritual aspect mostly of it. I'm Mark, I'm, I'm sensing that you probably want also something something about uh, sacredness of the water and, and what that is for you as well. Um, uh, okay. <laughs> I just, I mean, it's, again, as I said, I feel like when I, lobbied the halls of uh, Sacramento or Washington, D.C., or 
at the World Bank for 10 years in a row. I got to organize the lobby effort at the World Bank, letting them hear indigenous peoples from around the world. And I felt like, again, you know, Natasha, it's beautiful hearing you have scientists who have dedicated their passion to learning something, and yet they haven't, you know, until Palm's language opened up sacred, you know, our modern world is, you know, as you described so uh, powerfully and sadly, our modern education system, you can't talk about anything that connects to your heart and your gut. And, and this part of our brain that's connected to the miracle of this friggin' life we live in. And so trying to, uh, you know, I, I, I've only reclaimed the word sacred in the last 10 years, all my years of lobbying for rivers. We just could say how many people loved it. And it, you know, and it changed, it, you know, for me that I'd been raised in Sacramento, everyone smiles when I got on the river people smiled more profoundly than I had ever seen in my life. And it's like, and, but we couldn't articulate that because it's not measurable, but that being in the miracle of this incredible canyon with this crystal clear water, drinking, you know, out of buckets, drinking water, letting it wash all over you. It's like, and swimming in it, diving in it. We were, we became one with this earth and it was teaching us beyond anything our relatives had taught us. And it, yet it wasn't teaching from the old way, but experientially we were experiencing, whoa, there's a lot more going on. So you being able to go to elementary school and already knowing there is so much more than their teaching. You know, most of us have inherited a world where we're deprived of knowing that we live in a sacred friggin' miracle all around us. You know, that there's more and more beauty, more and more all over. And we inherited a system that can only do what it's done by being amputated and not being connected. So now we can take, 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 and we're in the middle of this shift. And having had the privilege of working with, when I started International Rivers, I got to work with colleagues from all around the world. And it was just, it, it just feels like we're at an interesting time. Back then, they too, like I had to do, they had to learn how to speak World Bank ease and economics and how many people were being eradicated and wiped out and how many species were being wiped out. And hearing this last few weeks, um, what's going on, you know, with the COP26 in, you know, in uh, um, Scotland, and it's the most I have heard the media repeating the language of indigenous voices. So it feels like your powerful film is coming out at a time when those who inherited the modern world are more and more knowing it's missing something. So like your scientist, Natasha, who go, oh, yeah, you're giving me permission to be able to start communicating something more in a different way. And so I think, you know, it's just what what perfect timing, and especially to it'd be so powerful to have your film go international, so people can expand their lexicon, <laughs> um, and more than that, their framework of the the mindset that we inherited that was so limited, and begin adding to the collective awakening that's going on that we're in the middle of as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think that's a beautiful segue into talking with Natasha a little bit about the film because I, I watched some of the pre-video that you did talking about your own growing up and your relationship with the earth. And I'm curious, how did you come about making this film or meeting with them and, and you know what the actual situation is or has been, what's been going on for those who are watching this interview and haven't seen the movie yet. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, for politicians or people at the World Bank or people at COP26, for a lot of people, it's difficult to wrap their head around the concept of sacred water. Um, but actually for children, it's, um, it's a lot easier. 
that was definitely my experience growing up in Venezuela. My uh, parents often uh, took us to uh, visit um, people who still lived on their ancestral lands, indigenous wisdom keepers, the Pemon people, the Huarao people in different places in Venezuela. And um, the idea of sacred water was, uh, was something that infused everything about how they lived. And mm. to me, coming from Caracas, um, where the river is uh, treated like a full on dump, um, it, it was like arriving to an island of sanity to be in the company of people mm. that regarded the um, water as sacred. And um, that was a feeling that I always wanted to be close to. So throughout my entire life, I've always looked for opportunities to stay close um, mm -hmm. to wisdom keepers. As a mother of a daughter who um, was born and raised just downstream from uh, Palm's tribe, I wanted to offer her a similar opportunity than my parents had offered me. And so as a filmmaker, I thought, well, maybe there's an opportunity to make a film. And right as that, I, the idea that I had originally was um, I could ask a young indigenous person to share one word from their ancestral language um, that had changed their life that they could offer to the next generation as medicine to heal our relationship with the earth. Um, because the idea was let's update children's vocabulary one word at a time. And um, Pom and I met um, at a conference where he was speaking and at the conference, a very beautiful conference called Geography of Hope. And um, the conference closed with a ceremony at, at um, the lands of a roundhouse of uh, uh, Coast on, on Coast Miwok um, land. And he offered a prayer um, for the ceremony. And it just, there was something that touched me and that also felt very familiar about. I just felt like, like home, like very comfortable. And my daughter was with me. And even though, you know, she had been at the conference the whole time and she was ready to go home, I said, oh, just one second. I just need to say hello uh, to, to him. And, and I went and I said, you know, this is me. And this is kind of like what's been coming to me. And his response, like the first words that he said was, I know my word. <laughs> and so that was it. And that was like the beginning of this, um, of this journey. And um, sacred water is a very common word in many indigenous languages, if not all, I don't wanna speak for all and I'm not a linguist, but it has been my experience that it's a, been, it's a very common word, which tells me that it must have been a very common word for all of us um, at some point. And this is a process of remembering, like remembering something that is so important to us as human beings and helping our children uh, remember. And I think that the most important thing that we can be doing right now is taking the guidance of indigenous wisdom keepers who still have that link to sacred water and to many other important words that whose meaning we have lost um, to guide us back to like our full potential as human beings to guide us back to healing the earth. And, and that's why we see people like, you know, very experienced conservationists like Peter Seligman, for example, who after 40 years of leading Conservation International has dedicated all of his efforts to uh, elevating the voice, championing, supporting indigenous wisdom keepers like this is the greatest opportunity um, that we have right now. So yeah, that's, that's why I was very excited to work on this film. And, and also one thing that the last thing I'd like to mention related to that is that um, the gift that I feel my parents offered me was to be able to learn directly from indigenous wisdom keepers. That's what I wanted to offer my daughter. And so even though we are co-directors, um, Pom had full creative control and complete authorship of the film. My role was really 
like to offer my filmmaking skills so that this could happen. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, that has been like a really great pleasure in working in, in that way. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, I just, just want to touch on the fact that, you know, within the, the work that I do with Tree Sisters and the people I've met, there is this resonance of people wanting to get back in touch, like that remembering you spoke to. There's just something that, that rings uh, something familiar, but we've kind of forgotten and need to bring back. So I love that you mentioned that. And I also love that you mentioned in your film poem that intuition is spiritual awareness. I think that is just probably one of the most beautiful quotes from the film. Um, yeah. Well, and, and I'm, I might add, I mean, this, uh, the beauty of you um, working to bring back language, you know, this, you know, most Americans know biodiversity and we know when we lose a species, we lose it for eternity. And yet few comprehend when we lose a culture and its language and its way of seeing, we lose, we lose this sacred connection that people have had with their place and a language that connected them. So everyone is forced to use the modern language that is just disconnected from our, all of our sacred neighbors, whether they be two-legged, four-legged, winged. It's, and so to return one word at a time to the children who know, and even the adults know, and we've all forgotten. So, so moved by your, your deepest knowing of both intuitively what you were gifted when you were young and helping return to this modern world language that helps us all reconnect at this time when we yearn to reconnect and live with this precious miracle we're, we're infused with. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I wanted to touch on that too, like uh, the adoption of the word sacred too, I guess from the church. Uh, we, we also use reverence as well to be reverent at sacred place, but also as a church language, you know, yeah. word. And, but it's, this, it's, a, it's a translation that we're trying to attempt to do here in right. using the English language and in, any language for that matter to try to interpret indigenous languages is always a, a feat. And so that's why the visual samples that we have and the, and the visual that this film is, helps us to interpret what Sawa man means. And that, I, know, I remember when Natasha first asked me about the word and I was like, oh, that's, that's pretty easy. Just one word to share. That's not too invasive. It's not too much to ask about sharing of the culture or anything. So- You revolutionary you. <laughs> you know, I was, I was like, yeah, sacred water. That's, that's what we're doing right now. We're, we're definitely- and there's a difference between because because sawal is the word for lack of a better word sacred sawal means that and then mem means water so there is a differentiation between mem and and sawal mem and and sawal mem being our uh, place that you can go to for for spiritual healing and 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 revelation and different interpretations of spiritual things in regards to what's going on in the world and that's the word that I wanted to use differentiated from just mem. I know, because because we, which is also spiritual and, and innately, but sawa mem is the is the really the word that we're looking for. I feel like as far as like diving deeper into what kind of world do we really live in here? What is this really about here? And what what kind of truths and miracles can really happen inside of this place that that we're a part of? And so trying to interpret that, you know, has always been kind of difficult for us. But that's that's why we made the film. Well, you know, even sacred waters, that's a translation, but you filling in that it's the ancient waters. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's like, huh? Because <laughs> we're not taught to think that way. So your definition, it, you, it, I mean, you really, your one word truly does become an evolutionary, revolutionary, you know, it's like, Oh, <laughs> there's a lot more to, a lot more to it. So beautiful to hear both of your impulses and deep knowing of what a gift it is at this time we're in and, uh, and the young people will get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Oh, no, I was just going to say that, like, um, you know, it's been such a beautiful journey um, to be on. Um, intuition was not just something that poems uh, spoke about in the film, but it was kind of like a guiding principle in the making of the film, the way in which the film was made. It was all guided intuitively, um, spirit led in that way. And it has, you know, it is currently leading us into these amazing places. And so one of the things that happened was um, we screened the film in uh, Cusco in, in Peru. And um, when we uh, screened the film, there were some, and the way in which it was screened, it was like shown. And then I left the prayer and the song and then turn the volume down and then I basically live dubbed it into Spanish so they didn't receive it with Pum's voice or music or natural sound or anything that's how they got it um and but the elders stood up and said you know we don't know who this California man is but he completely represents us and we would like I mean which like he completely represents us. That is like so powerful, just like that. And then, but then they said, we would like to request for the film to be dubbed in Quechua. Not because the Quechuan young people don't understand Spanish because the film is already subtitled in Spanish, but they requested for the film to be dubbed in Quechua to help with the self-esteem of the Quechuan um, young people which means that basically the elders were noticing that the young people were like, you know, absorbing, um, yeah, some of the negativity, the, the, yeah. The limitations of Spanish, the, the amputation that Stan, Spanish is imbued with, not their own native connected language. Yes, that's right. And also, you know, that, that the elders saw an opportunity for the young people to really feel proud of who they are and like stand confidently in that. And especially during these times. So what they saw in Palm was like an example of that, an example of what all indigenous uh, you know, youth could embody. And so when we first talked about this, it, was like, it seemed like such a crazy dream to have the film dubbed in Quechua. Well, that crazy dream has become a reality uh, a young Quechuan man in the Andes um, with his grandfather worked to dub the whole film in Quechua. Wow. It's so beautiful. It's actually included in the extras um, on the link that, that people will receive um, a, if they want to watch uh, the film. And um, now uh, we've also received requests uh, to dub it in Tibetan and and it looks wow. like this is going to continue. So you have this small tribe from Mount Shasta. Like, it's not legal or formal. <laughs> yeah, unrecognized, you know, right. federally unrecognized. And, but yet speaking such a recognizable truth that is bringing together like the Andes and the Himalayas. Um, and so it's, it, like this project has really taken a life of its own in, in many ways. It's like, you know, very much alive and continuing. And so we're just, yeah, excited to see how it all continues to unfold. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to mention that when I watched it, there was a, a level of energy and awareness that was present and just you know, I thought I was going to hear a story or sometimes you watch things and it's just a presentation of uh, what's happened so far. But this was like a live piece and it just brought me into awareness and it just made me go to a different level. And I think it's really powerful the way it was filmed and how it was filmed and, and what you bring to it, um, just how you spoke and, and your life experience. And I want to also make sure that we cover a little bit about what's happened to your tribe, what happened to the the Cloud River and the Sacramento River and the Salmon Fish. Um, is there, can we take a little time to talk about that and what that situation, if there's been any updates since you made the film? Yes, definitely. The salmon is definitely one of the reasons why we made this film as well. Wanted to tell that story and tell the story because it's a long one and it's, it's too long to really encompass in uh, 
you know, two minutes, but like it's, um, we're basically trying to restore our salmon returns um, up the McLeod River. They're blocked because of Shasta Dam, of course, since the 1940s. And so we're working on that right now with NOAA Fisheries and they're developing a, well, they, they're, yeah, in the, they're, they're developing a pilot project to restore the salmon around Shasta Dam. And so we're in the process of trying to restore a, uh, sorry, a fish passageway, swimway, natural one, where they don't have to be truck and hauled because that's what they want to do is truck and haul the fish around the dam, which we don't want to do because it traumatizes the fishes and it makes them kind of, uh, you know, dis it, it dysregulates them. And we want them to have a more natural swimway around Chess Dam, which is right next to our village right here, where I'm at right now, currently in Redding, outside of Redding, California and Bear Mountain. And we're looking around for people that know how to do hydrology work and people that know how to do science in regards to restoration of a creek bed that's dried up and uh, we're working to make that, you know, a viable place for fish to swim past. And so that's, that's all our efforts for the salmon return right now um, on a scientific activist political level. Of course, there's a, there's a whole spiritual level that we're always working from. And this is what we're, we're always saying prayers for and following the prayer, following the intuition of where we're supposed to go with the salmon return and how to do that isn't always apparent, but through prayer, we get answers and, and we follow that as best that we can. And, and um, this leads into, this is why this leads into our dances and to our songs and how we even got on this place in the first, how journey on the first place is because salmon came into some of our ceremonies in the spiritual sense and the spiritual interpretation of it. And they're the ones who spoke up on behalf of themselves and reminded us that, Hey, you, you forgot about us. Like we have to, we want to come back up the river systems and around the dam, basically is what they said. And so we followed that. And here we are today with everything that we're doing. It wasn't because we felt like it was supposed to happen, but they actually came in and told us it was the interpretation. That's absolutely beautiful. I know you all mentioned earlier, you also are looking for translators. So if there's any calls for, you know, anything that would help get the word out about this film and about the project and what's going on, please feel free to share that with us. Well, I, I, I'll just, I'll just speak, I mean, say my hope that that happens. I'll, and back to when you said that even Tibetans are thinking of translating it. You know, when, when again, when I had the privilege of coordinating Earth Day globally, we had volunteers translate our invite in 15 languages and our newsletter was translated at least in 10 languages all by volunteers. And you having it translated in Quechua, potentially in Tibetan, it's like, it would be fascinating if you almost prioritized rather than all the mainstream languages by getting it into indigenous languages and like the Quechua elders, their, their next generation getting one word and having to remember their one word that can translate. And then at some point you could do a film on each of the different cultures translation of, the, you know, how, I mean, how people who have stayed in touch with sacred waters, how deeply and profoundly that is in a, anyway, you're, you are revolutionizing the world. And I will hope that out of the amazing Tree Sister community, you will get volunteers to translate it into, you know, French and German and uh, Portuguese and anyway. Oh, yes, you, you said you're already in Portugal or not? Uh, no, it, the film is not in Portuguese yet. We, we did have an opportunity to screen it um, at some festivals in, in Brazil. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, yes, that's, that's really our hope. We would really um, love to continue to dub the film so that uh, indigenous people can enjoy it in their, in their own um, language as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, also um, for people who have an opportunity to watch the film and are touched by the film, um, Palm and uh, Winneman went to tribe are extending a very special um, invitation 
um, to uh, help fund the building of a roundhouse, which is the first time in a hundred years that the tribe builds a roundhouse. And the very first time that an invitation like this has been, you know, extended outside. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you want to say a little bit about that, uh, Pom, about the roundhouse and how that relates to what we've been talking about. Yeah, the, the house is called a, a clute in our language, and it's a earth and lodge representative of Mother Earth's womb, and it, it's a creation place, and it, and it births new things and into the world, and it calls in a lot of the spirit helpers to do that, including the salmon, including the water and the fire, and the celestial beings from from up in the star systems and, and encompasses the laws of creation, basically, is what the house is, like I was saying, Mother Earth's womb. And, and ha there's a whole ceremonial context in which that takes place. There's a lot that goes into that. And there's a lot of other ceremonies as well. And so this is like a prayers for humanity, but beyond humanity into the creation aspect of all things is what we're trying to tap into and attempting to tap into and what the house is designed to tap into beyond human experience. But we're just doing our part as humans in the prayerful network uh, cosmology that we're a part of here and doing our original jobs. And not only the original ones, but ref as them doing the prayers reflective of the current times in the now and providing the, the healing and the, and the hope and spreading the love and spreading the medicine for the rest of, to the rest of people, but also to the rest of the land, to the waters, the fires, to the mountains and doing our responsibility, our sacred protocols, our sacred responsibilities to maintain our connection like that. And, 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 and now like that, it's, it's kind of in response to an emergency type situation when the 1870s first came in is when the roundhouses first came in. And that was in response to, to things that were not going so well during that time and we're still in those times is the interpretation and with the uh, advancing of technology and the advancing of the extractive industry and governments and everything that's losing touch with the sacred this is still very much needed in the current time and so we venture to build one as as much of a feat that is for us because it's a very big deal for us and we are doing our our maintenance to be ready for that but that's and there's a lot that goes into it and it's not just for when two people but that's going to extend to all people not saying that everybody is invited to this place particular ceremony but there will be representatives from all people there and spiritual people from all lineages um, will be will be will be welcomed there and helping to for this for this um you know, new, bringing in of the new earth, this recreation of what we're talking about here, this, this new, lack of a better phrase, heaven on earth, and being bringing in back into the sacred uh, ways of be bringing the sacred ways back into being and maintaining those because, yeah, it's, it's, it's very much threatening to be lost. And this is our like way to maintain it and to bring it, bring it back and, and, and make it flourish again. They call it the flowering way. It's like a, it's like the process in which the earth regenerates itself. It goes into spring and it reflowers itself and the pollen spreads and everything regrows. And that's what it's tapping into this, this roundhouse. And, and that's what we're raising funds for. It caught, we're estimating it costs about, about $70,000 to build it. And it includes all of the, all of the work to, to rent the equipment as well as providing stipends for the people who are dedicating their, themselves to this way of life. Because back in the early days, they would have been taken care of and compensated for, for this kind of work to take place. And that doesn't really translate into today's capitalistic society. And we're saying that maybe it can, maybe, maybe it can be compensated and work in this way as this world spins and, and to readjust ourselves to, to what the world is right now. And so that's why we're doing a fundraiser for it. We're not a recognized tribe. We don't have allocated funds. We don't, we don't have any departments designed to, 
up keep these kinds of things we don't we don't have federal funding we cannot ever apply for federal grants in that sense as a recognized tribe we're, we're looking for ways around that but as of now gofundme has provided a platform to to do this so that's that's my long-winded answer to <laughs> what a roundhouse is and the reasons behind it and why we feel like we should we should keep it going for for now and into the foreseeable future for our future generations to 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 have a a, a base to work from to 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 go back to 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 heal to be themselves and to provide a, a safe space to be prayerful inside of you know that's that's um, welcoming of all religions as well by the way yeah and. And also the reason why um, the invitation is for people who have been touched by the film. I mean, the film is only 20 minutes um, long, um, but this is kind of a way of ensuring that there's alignment, right? That, that there's like a heart connection, spiritual connection with the roundhouse so that every single, you know, uh, piece of it is infused with that prayerful intention. That, that's absolutely beautiful. And I love that it's a follow through energetically. You know, the people who are donating it are actually bringing that energy into the building. This sound, you know, this sounds amazing. I can just see your passion and excitement about it when you spoke about it, Palm. And it's, I think it's more needed than like the cop talks, I, one of my colleagues went and she stayed in an area with the indigenous people from around the world. And the conversations she had were far more important than the conversations going on in the cop halls where they weren't even invited. So to know that a place like this exists, where this coming together is going to be happening is so beautiful and so exciting to me. And I, um, I'm so wishing you every, every positive result from it and how powerful and how important it's going to be. Um, yeah, I'm very excited about this project. And I appreciate you sharing. I will make sure we have links up for everything on our website so you can view the film, learn more about the Roundhouse. Um, yeah, I'm just so excited. Do either of you have one last thing that you'd really want to share from your experience or wisdom in your own lives that you would love for our network to know? If you have the chance to like say anything to the world that you would like them to know. <laughs> you can go first, Natasha, if you like. Um, I think once you give uh, yourself the time to settle into this sacred space, um, we all have access to it. And uh, never has it been more important that we protect the time that we spend in this space. Um, because the challenges that we are facing right now are, are much bigger than what we can handle uh, only in a physical sense, only in an intellectual sense, only in an emotional sense. We also have to tap into spiritual dimension of all of it. And, um, and we've lost touch with that in the last 500 years um, as we have tried to dominate the earth. And this is our opportunity to, to wake up and to um, come back and to restore the sacred in water and sacred in land to you know, support rematriation, which indigenous wisdom keepers have been calling um, us to do urgently for a long time right now. I'd say one of the most important things for, for me in regards to the future is the upcoming uh, pull more and more into screens like this, Zoom meetings and the advancement of this kind of technology will be pulling at our youth more and more and we should be mindful that that's what their agenda is, is to pull more people into these virtual spaces. And 
we will be venturing in those spaces. I have a question for the indigenous people around the world actually is how far do they want to venture into these spaces, which will be more and more pronounced in the upcoming five to 10 years, such as the metaverse coming into play. There's multiple virtual reality spaces coming into play and whether or not we want to venture into there, put it basically, do we want to put our sacred fires into those spaces so that we can provide safe space inside of virtual reality and basically tell them to come out of virtual reality and come to the real fires, come to the real sacred places that are out here in the real world and to be wary of venturing too far into that. And if we are going to do that, how much of the sacred do we want to put inside of these places? And that's a real serious question for my community right now as we speak. And some big decisions need to be made. And that's, that's it's a kind of a warning, but it's kind of a way to be like a real about it. And like, hey, this is, kids really are getting lost in video games in this very moment. And how do we get them out into our ceremonies in an aligned, prayerful way? And so that's what I have to say about that and just want to leave that question for people and really take it seriously because that's, that's something that's going to be getting more and more real as we go here on out. So we, uh, this, is, this is the reasons why we go into documentary film work is because we know that it reaches a lot of people and so that we want to basically tell them about sacred things that are out in the real world and uh, to develop self so that we can hear those more clearly. Um, yeah, not sure how to exactly close that, but that's, that's, my, that's my, something that I needed to get off my chest because that's something that is really pressing and will be pressing. My prediction is going to be pressing more and more as time continues on for the younger people. And yeah, that's, that's all I have to say about that, I guess. And, and that's why we have to build this house to, to actively reverse those energies into something that's more of a, a real creation part of the, the, this world, um, which, is, which is, you know, like, it's about like being, I don't know, it's, it's, it's basically the laws of creation and life, like why we have life, what makes our heart beat like for real inside of us. It's not, uh, it's something that can't really be explained really. <laughs> and so I know that I'm going off and on because this is a, a, a huge topic that I'm very much dived into at this moment and tuned into. And it's, it's kind of pressing and I feel like I wouldn't be able to doing a, a service to <laughs> my people if I don't say these kinds of things because this is a, the real, a, a real threat because how do, you, how do you keep people to, you know, how do, how do you keep people caring about the salmon? How do you keep people caring about water and about ceremony and about fire and about the sacred and about animals and restoration of homelands and, and creek beds and everything like this when there's a, a, a energy that's trying to siphon the energy into the computer screen? And so... That's why we're here. We're not, not going to shy away from the computer screen. We're going to go into it and we're going to talk about it <laughs> and we're going to call it out for what it is and still be like, hey, the sacred is still more powerful and more in alignment with what's really going on in the true human spirit. And just saying that and just leaving it at that. That's all I got to say. That's all I want to say. But I'm, I'm here in the updated technology, cutting edge technology, still saying the old way is still the way out and the way forward you know i might just offer how profound it is here you both describe being spirit-led and i'll share one small story of having been with claire and she was speaking at the women's international networking conference in rome and the people we met it just kept they were like eight women that we just kept running into and every time we tried to you know, there's no communication We'd go to the elevator and the door would open, they'd walk out. I mean, it's like we just, the miracle, we kept meeting these people at the right time. 
And at the end, we were sitting with them after the conference was over and Claire was marveling at these miraculous meeting the right people at the right time. And then she said something like, I look forward to living my life knowing that the sacred is always leading us, the, the spirit is leading us, that trusting this divine guidance. So I think you poem have left everyone with a really powerful question of how does the tech, well, I mean, I won't try to distill your poignant question. And yet knowing that the two of you and Tara are, are spirit led, that too will be a reminder for everyone to pay attention. Am I seduced by how much fun this is? Or am I drawn because my soul is calling and I, my soul can hear something that my genius can get anyway. So thank you both for living your lives spirit led and gifting the world with the revolution of way more than one word. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so very much. That wisdom that you shared is so important. Absolutely. I'm so glad that you actually brought that forward. So thank you so much. And thank you all for being here. And I look forward to um, finding ways to help you get your film out and making sure everyone in our network sees it. Thank you. Thank you for thank having you us. so much. Thank you. Yeah.